Hey, thanks for being a part of the conversation. Let's do it. Let's play it forward. These are real people with real stories. The struggle to play it forward. Episode number 631 is Adam Long's extensive conversation with a radio host who was raised in Montana, who came incredibly close to realizing his childhood fantasy. Then what? Well, I know one thing. This interview took place at 9 p.m. Most radio people who do morning shows are in bed by 7.30, 8 o'clock. Yeah, I fell asleep before the interview. And you can tell. Oh, I hear you now. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. you little rock star. What are you doing? <laughs> well, I was looking forward to chatting with you, you know, and have an interview proper with you, actually. It's so um, funny to hear your voice and not see you because I'm such a radio person. So to hear your voice to me is like theater of the mind. I mean, that, that's what I love about being a radio person is that, you know, when you don't know what the person looks like, and, and how they're going to ask you the questions, that to me is the most amazing part of the journey. <laughs> That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. I uh, I could not agree more. Yeah. I just, you know, I do this mostly for fun because I just enjoy talking to people and hearing their stories. I mean, you know, some of these things uh, catch on and people enjoy them. I recently interviewed uh, Guy Aoki, who was the mixer for American Top 40 during the last wow. year. Casey was there. Oh, well, yeah. you, you know, I was up for American Top 40 in 1988. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Oh, we're gonna talk my about God, that. <laughs> dude, I'm so amazed. <laughs> yeah, we're getting we're going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've done my I've done a little bit of my homework here. So. Wow, well, I'm, I'm very, yeah, we're, very we're blessed just- to be here. Yeah, well, I'm I'm blessed to have you, my friend. Yeah, this is great, and I appreciate it. And I'm actually going to try to tie this in to my previous American Top 40. Uh, You know, we're going to obviously talk about other things, but the American Top 40 thing seems to get the fans of that show interested, and I'm you know, we want to get more as many people as we can listening right. is the way I look at it. So if I say, you know, if I kind of build, advertise it as, you know, the almost – host of American Top 40 <laughs> and his stories. I think people will listen. I really do. I think they'll be intrigued. And so that's going to be my selling point. So. Adam, not even a month ago, I was looking at the scripts they sent me. And I, I was sitting there looking at the letters they sent to me from ABC Watermark Incorporated. And it's so mm-hmm. funny that you would even bring this up because I was just holding on to those, those things that were, that were basically, what was it, 30, 40 years ago? I mean, I mean, yeah. I, it, it, and, and I, I really did hold on to them in a way going, okay, I gave it my best shot. At least I can say I gave it my best shot. Yeah, you you I'm sure you did. I have no no qualms about that for sure, but yeah, I talked to I, I but I interviewed Guy Aoki. He was the uh he was the guy who was actually sitting in the recording booth when Casey had his famous meltdown. Whoa. Uh, really? He, he was there. Yeah, he was there and he said, "Adam, he said you he said You've got the audio in your head. You've heard the tapes. He goes, I've got the visual. He goes, I was there. I watched Casey throw his glasses across the across the console. He said, <laughs> it was it was fantastic. It's it's it was a really good interview and uh and actually Guy was uh, gave the eulogy at Casey's funeral. They were very close personally. Wow. So it was a uh, it was a very nice interview that I did with him. So, you know, that was a that a lot of people listened to that and I thought, you know, and I knew your I knew a little bit about your AT forty story and I thought, you know, he's a guy that I think I should talk to because I think he's got you know, that's part of the story, but not the whole story. And so uh Well I think so anyway. a lot of listeners don't understand what we go through as writers, performers, and producers. And and mm-hmm. so I mean I totally understand what you went through in talking with him because you know, him being in that room, you you, you don't realize what the moment is all about. When things start to melt down in that moment how do you regain control and composure and 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 it's one of the toughest things that that, you know that the listeners don't understand i don't expect them to understand but as professionals Mm -hmm. we've got to get a grip and get moving on no matter what it is but but today compared to when when you heard his meltdown that wasn't the digital age where you could go in there and splice that stuff out that was tape that was tape that's right nowadays i sit here and take notes as things are breaking down Yep, same here. Same here. When I when I, I there's a goof up, I make a note. Hey, I'll cut this out at yeah. such and such moment. But yeah, you're right. You, you know, you don't. Yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. So uh, so so yeah. I, I uh, you know. But yeah, this session now, like I said, I'm limited to 40 minutes here. Um, but uh, if if we go, you know, if we if we're on a good groove, uh, what I did with Guy actually the 
one I was talking about, the interview I was just talking about. Guy, guy and I did the Zoom, and it ran out, and he said, there's more to tell. And I said, well, <laughs> well I'll just send you another link. So but, that's but, what I did, and we just picked it right up, and I spliced them together. And, and when you listen to it, you can't even tell there was two separate sessions. But Adam, that's, so, when, that's when you look at them and you say, hey, look, here's the thing. I want you to come back to this show, okay? The door is always open. Come back. Be brilliant. I'll see you later on. I mean, the, I, I'm always searching for the next conversation, not just the one that we're just having right now that's true that is, that is true i i am i have had some return guests in fact i've got one coming up uh next tuesday i'm going to tape one with a guy who does a, he's got an online radio station actually two one of them's called the retro attic and the other one is the awfully awesome 80s and they're really good because he only plays songs that are not heard on commercial radio <laughs> anymore. Like, so sold millions of copies, but yep, you don't hear them yep, anymore. Yep. You know, Kaja so Goo Goo, too shy. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, you, you get it. Well, listen, my friend, I'm going to go ahead and hit the record button, and uh, we're going to go ahead and get this rolling. And like I said, if you feel like we want to go on uh, after this session ends, and uh, we, we can do that, or we can just, you know, make it a short well, one. Well, first of all, I'm, so. very, I'm, I'm shocked, and I feel bl- very blessed that you think that I could go 40, 40 minutes, because... Because I mean, it's it's like it's like in my life, I don't think that I deserve forty minutes. I I I would be okay if you went three minutes. That that you know because you know <laughs> I've lived this life, you know, and you're about ready to wear my shoes. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm gonna hit the record button, and here we go. I'll hit that button. Recording in progress. Oh, there! I know that sound. I know that sound. Uh, Woo! That famous sound, yes. So I'm going to count down three, two, one, and uh, and then we'll just we'll roll with it. And anything we uh, goof up, I'll just make a note and we'll we'll trim her out. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So uh, three, two, and one. Welcome again to another episode of Adam's Corner. I'm Adam Long, your host, and uh, I've got a really interesting guest on today's show, and that would be Mr. Arrow Collins and. Um, for those of you who don't know his story, it's quite an interesting story. I've got to tell you that. Um, I he, he was one of the voices of my uh, teenage years mm-hmm. uh, growing up in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. He had a wonderful show that used to be broadcast every night at 10 o'clock, and it was called 10 at 10. Oh, my God. And it was a song where he would play – it was a show, rather, that where he would play uh, 10 oldies from a particular year at 10 o'clock. And he'll tell you more about that as we go on. I, I'm not going to – I'm not going to steal his thunder, as it were, but uh, that's where I first became aware of him. And then through other circumstances, we have actually become friendly in other uh, through other venues. And that's another story we can get into later. And this all ties into American Top 40. And we'll get to that, too. Adam, so there's a lot to uh, you, you <laughs> there's need, a lot here. You need to understand when I came down from Billings, Montana in 1985, Bill Conway uh, did everything he could to 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 let the the managers know that I wasn't about just being a radio jock. And so when Bill Conway gave me the chance to do 10 at 10, I had to go to the library in Uptown Charlotte and do research. I mean, I literally spent so much time in in all of these encyclopedias and all of these books and I sat outside in on, on on my on my little little patio area catching the worst burn of my life because I was from Montana I didn't know what southern sunshine was and 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 to put that show together and then when it went syndicated I was I was like oh my god so that's why I went syndicated because I suffered in bringing this show together but it, I was so dedicated and loyal into bringing what Bill Conway envisioned it, it was such a moment for me well, it's it was an amazing show. It really was, and and it was it was a very very interesting and uh, you know and certainly uh, something that I looked forward to every night that it was God on. God bless every you. Week. God was, bless was, you. You uh, have oh my God, you have no idea. You have no idea. <laughs> it was appointment radio. It really was, and the fact that uh, you and I would eventually become uh, friendly with each other and and uh, all of that that just. That never entered my mind back then, but isn't that funny how the world works? So anyway, we'll we'll go back to uh, the basics, and uh, you know, we'll uh, basically I, I always like to start, you know, at the beginning and just talk about where you were born and raised. You kind of alluded to it there, and we can talk about your uh, your in- first interest in broadcasting, how that all came about. Um, Sheridan, Wyoming, is where I was born. Billings, Montana, is where I built my first radio station in my bedroom as a 13 year old kid. I had a Mister microphone. I could broadcast 100 feet from my house. 
And what I wanted more than anything in the world was for my mother to hear me downstairs. And and so that's what that Mr. Microphone was about. She could hear me up there in my bedroom through that through her own little stereo because I could put it at 98.7. And and that w- that meant so much to me. And so, I mean, I, I did everything I could to always have a performance for my mother every day. Very, very interesting. Yeah, I, I remember Mr. Microphone very, very well. I and still I have, I have it. One. Adam, I still have it. <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> and I bet it works. I bet it, it works. Well, I'm sure it does. Like but, it but, but, but it's like that was the one thing that when, when I went back to Montana in, in what maybe, maybe 1992, I went up into the attic of my bedroom and I made sure that I grabbed that microphone and brought it to Carolina because I didn't want anybody else to have their hands on this microphone. Yeah, it was... Um... It was like your lightsaber. If it you was a Star Wars analogy, yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, it's it's like shown the way, so to speak. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a beacon of light you, that you followed. Yeah, you know, it's funny because we talk about this sort of thing, and people don't realize what you know. It's so easy now, and we just take it for granted that we can, you know, like what we're doing here. We can record a conversation and post it, and uh, it can be literally heard all around the world. I have people who listen to my podcast as far away as New Zealand. Yep. I get uh, occasional, I've got a fan, uh, some fans out in the UK who listen to me regularly. Uh, and it's just, it blows my mind, you know, to think that back then we could have never imagined, you know, so just to have a Mr. Microphone where we could broadcast in our house was, we felt like we were really special when yep. we had that sort of thing going on. Yep. So it's it's just it's mind blowing. We couldn't have imagined all of this. So yeah. Uh, so were you a music fan? I guess that's the next question. Uh, when you were growing up, uh, you know. You know what? What's really just, interesting, Adam, is that I grew up listening to great pop music as well as rock music, and that really actually came and bit me in the butt in the way that I wanted to be on ninety nine point seven The Fox so bad here in Charlotte, and and I was typecast as an adult contemporary jock, and and I remember Jeff Kent telling me that no, no, you've got an image, you you don't need to be on my radio station, and and I looked at him and I said, can can I? You're not talking about the latest this Black Sabbath album. I, I know about that because this is my life. And I walked down the hallway because he knew I was pissed off. And he says, I'm going to give you one minute every day to give me a classic rock report. And that's what changed my life forever. All of a sudden, that gave me a classic rock report, which led to me talking to Yoko Ono and everybody else ever since. And that's where the podcasting began because he, he gave me one minute every day because I was so pissed off that he felt I was attached to my Michael Bolton. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Yeah. I, I, uh, and I didn't remember those, uh, rock reports. I, for some reason, I, that just, that's something that I, that I probably knew about it at the time, but it's, it's, it's a detail that I had totally forgotten. Um, yeah, I worked as a promotions assistant at 104.7 myself Shut in 1992, up. which is, yeah, I did. Uh, it was, a, it was a, um, a temporary thing and it, it unfortunately didn't really lead to anything permanent. But, uh, yeah, I worked for uh, a lady who was over promotions, Kathy O'Neill, I think was her name, mm. I, from what I remember. And uh, anyway, yeah, so I would basically go and uh, set up the uh, – do all the equipment setups for the uh, the jocks who would come in and do their pr- live promotion from – such and such car dealership and all of that sort of stuff. So I did, I did that for a while and it was very, it gave me a taste of it. It was very interesting to me. And so, uh, yeah. And, um, uh, Jeff Kent's uh, wife, Becky Kent was at the station at that time and she would do, uh, I, I actually had some interactions with her a really nice lady. Uh, and she did an oldie show on Saturday night Shut from seven up. to ten. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, she did. Yeah, she did. This is uh, like circa ni- nineteen ninety two, probably like summer nineteen ninety two. I'm thinking. Wow. Uh, but uh, but yeah, this is not about me, of course. This is about you. But it's just uh, I, I know a little bit of, of of that of which you speak. That's the only reason I'm <laughs> bringing this up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the, anyway, but yeah, the, the, thing, the yeah. thing about radio is that I, I swear that the greatest shows that could have been were silenced by program directors and consultants who thought they knew better. And, and, and that, you know, that's what I love about podcasting is that, you know, I mean, even when I go back and I look at what, what Gordon Ramsay is doing with his cooking shows, that man has 15 billion shows and I'm going, oh, I get it. 
I get it because because when 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 creative people are set free with their ideas and their imaginations, we're given the opportunity to create at levels that listeners will one day discover. It doesn't have to be about now, but in the world world of radio, it has to be about well, how my how how my, much are, of my ratings are going to going to be affected here? And it's like, man, you you screwed up. You screwed up. Yeah, that that's that's a good point. It, it's it's true and 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 it's sad it's sad to think about the uh the the things that uh, may not have come to fruition because of oh my god you're exactly right yeah yeah um well i was gonna let you tell us a little bit about your trajectory how you wound up uh in the charlotte market you know uh the the steps you know when you're in, when you were in radio in the 80s there were you know it's like you're taking baby steps to get you know play you start with whatever station will take you and then you just work your way up and eventually, you know, get the bigger and bigger things, hopefully. And I was going to let you tell us about that trajectory. And uh, did you uh, have any like formal training or did you just go and, you know, go to a radio station oh, knocking on the door? No, or? no. I, <laughs> okay. I, I started at the Billings Career Center in Billings, Montana. I knew what I was going to okay. be at such an early age. And and I went to Coin Radio when I was just a baby. I, 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 I should have landed my first job at 14. And my dad wouldn't take me to Laurel, Montana. He said, he says, that's too far away. And it's 15 miles from Billings. And I thought, nowadays, I drive 30 miles to do things. And it's like, what? why wouldn't my dad take me f- you know, 15 miles to a radio station? So I had to wait till Coin Radio gave me that break. And, and so while I was in high school, I was a part-time jock on a country music radio station. So And I was doing countdowns. I was doing specialty programming even on that country music radio station. And I'll never forget Lonnie Bell telling me, there's this band out of Tennessee, Clarence, that you're going to love. And and what's going to happen is, Clarence, this, this band is going to be bigger than the Beatles. It was Alabama. And then he said, hey, there's this female performer. She's going to be so big, you're not going to ever believe that you were here when she started out, Reba McIntyre. And and it's and it's like it's like holy crap! How is it that I'm able to be here in these moments of birth? And what am I going to do about it to preserve it for f- for future listeners? And and that's what I that really drove me. So so when I went from 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 K O Y N and Billings, and I went to and then I went to uh, K X L O in Lewistown, Montana. It was that I had to pay my dues. I always knew that. But the thing is, is that I went from Clarence. To CT in Lewistown, when I came back to Billings, it was CT, but I was like, I can't stand that name because I can't be myself and and be a radio guy at the same time because they're not one and the same. I need to come up with some sort of image. So when I went to Cook Radio, that's when I became Arrow Collins. And and because all of a sudden it was like, oh my God, I can breathe. Arrow can be left at the radio station. CT and Clarence can go home. Yes, very. Yeah, that's yeah, and it totally has worked. I mean, you know, that's that's how we know you. <laughs> Woo! So, yeah, w- wise choice on your part. On your on your part, I would say. But yeah, and that uh, and and that's 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 a great analogy about just leaving it at the uh, at the station when you're done and becoming you know a regular person in your. In, you know, that's that's interesting. I like that. I really do. Um, yeah, so so you get to Charlotte now. Did you come to Charlotte from Louisville? Is that no Charlotte? You- no, no. I came from, I came to Charlotte from Billings, Montana, because oh, I mean I was I was in. Listen, this, this is a true story, and I hope I don't offend anybody. I was no. in the Billings Library with my very good friend Brian. Brian knew that I wanted to be very big in radio, and I was trying to get to Los Angeles. And he says, "Do not go the route of normal people in Billings, where they go to Boise, then they go to Spokane, and then they go, then they go to California." He says, "I need you to." go to the east coast and then come back to 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 california you need to go find yourself and and brian who who and i he and i are still so so close and and he he goes we need to go and we need to put you in a place where people don't know where you are and you need to build it and create it and so we found this radio station called easy 104 in charlotte north carolina and i was sitting there in the library going sleazy as a whore sleazy as a whore and and (laughs) and and he goes he says that's the one and so when when i sent the air check it was first of all the first one went in a, in a in a diet coke can no no in a coke can and 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 they didn't answer and so i put the air check and the resume in a coke can and i said oh i didn't realize you were on a diet so then i put it in a diet coke can they didn't answer so then i put it in a bounce box and then and i said look i'm trying to take the static out of your relationship with your listeners with this bounce i can make sure that you have the greatest nighttime show you have ever had in your life that's when they hired me 
Nice. Very good. <laughs> oh my God. It was such it was such a challenge. And I don't know why that I felt like I was so dedicated and, and determined to come to Charlotte. But you know, I've got air checks. Uh, my final show at Cook Radio and Billings, it says, I'm going to Charlotte, South Carolina. And you know what? When I when I turned in Spartanburg and it was going toward North Carolina, I went, Oh crap. Uh, it's not in South Carolina. I was like, oh my god! I'm I, I guess I'm living in South in North Carolina. I didn't know that. <laughs> that was a that was a cruel reality, I guess. When you but but turned out to be fortuitous, I guess. Right, and then, the, then uh, I went then Indian. I went by the giant peach and Gaffney. And I'm going, what the heck is going on here? Oh yeah, <laughs> yes. There's there's one right off of uh, Interstate 85 for anybody listening who doesn't know. There's a giant peach, literally. Uh, right there as you go down 85 south at a, at a certain point when you're getting near Spartanburg. So, uh, yeah, it's um, very, very, uh, yeah, it's it has to be seen. Um, it, it must be. So anyway, so you get to Charlotte and this is like, uh, I don't know, circa 1985, yep, I'm yep. thinking. Yeah, OK. And so uh, obviously when you when you get there, you're not doing 10 at 10. You're just kind of doing the late uh, the, the night shift. I think you were doing at that time and yeah and very bored because it was like i don't want to be just a jock i've never been that guy even when i was at cook when i was at coin when i was at kbmy or k kxlo or, or klyc it was always about specialty programming i've always tried to do specialty programming because i didn't want to be that jock and here's the reason why Casey Kasem, American Top 40. That was the very reason why I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to be a jock on the radio. I wanted to be a storyteller. Yeah, and you did that very well. You you finally got your chance to do that after a while. And, uh, and, and you alluded to it earlier with the 10 at 10. And so that was a concept that you just, uh, was it something that had been gestating uh, before you got to Charlotte? Or was it something that just came to you when you were actually in the Charlotte market and, and you know, no, it was one, it was one hundred percent Bill Conway, and and what happened oh, from okay. that point forward? I did all the research in the library, and then I started. I I, I I teamed up with the Associated Press, and all of a sudden, I was collecting sound bites from everything. Listen, Adam, I have got every sound bite from the Iran Contra affair. I've got every. I have got so much sound from from that era that I don't know what to do with it. I, I don't I don't know who to give it to. I don't know who who wants it because we live in this generation of the of the internet where you can get it anyway but i have documented it and i have i have put it in a library where all of that sound is readily available and and it's like i i really don't know what to do with it but but it was my addiction and my passion to save everything that was going on when it came to to history yeah and that's you know it's good to have that foresight because you know i was talking to pete battistini who wrote the uh, book about american top 40 i talked he's another uh, i guess that i've had on the show and he has the largest collection of at40 memorabilia he actually <laughs> has the actual index cards that casey read when he was doing the year in countdowns like the 1975 countdown and all of that he's got the actual index cards that casey held in his hand when he was doing the the countdowns and pete told me he said you know I just don't know what I'm going to do with this stuff. He goes, yep. I've got all this, you know, this large color. His collection was so big that when Casey Kasem came to do uh, a benefit in Indianapolis, Indiana, which is where he lives, Casey actually came to his house and toured it. That's how big the collection wow. was. So, wow. um, yeah, but he doesn't know what he's going to do. And it's exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. it, it's a real problem because, you know, none of, us are, none of us are getting younger. And, you know, we hope to be around a while. But, you know, we want this stuff to uh, – continue on in perpetuity and we just you know we have to think about these things and so yeah. that that was a problem that he was discussing as well so it's similar to what you're you're talking about there i i think um, one of the main reasons why i didn't get the job is because i was such a casey Kasem fan that I sounded like Casey Kasem. Hello again. I'm Casey Kasem from American Top 40. And now at number <laughs> one this week is that one love song that you really want to play at your wedding. And the thing, when you go back and you listen to the air check that I sent to ABC Watermark Incorporated, I mean, it, it's like, you know, it's like, damn it. Damn it. Why wasn't I myself? I, I just, it really hurt me so badly that, that I was trying to, but, but the thing about it is it was Casey's script in front of me. And, and I, I really, I, I felt like that I didn't make it me. I made it about Casey because I was trying to honor him and keep his sound alive. 
Well, yeah. Well, well, let's tell the whole story uh, uh, piece by piece, bit by bit, because it is an interesting story. I mean, obviously, Casey Kasem was uh, in contract negotiations with Watermark, and uh, the, things were not. I guess at that point, it was ABC Radio. I think that yeah. they had bought yeah. out. Yeah, uh, it was ABC at the, at that point, and so ABC. Uh, was not really he wasn't happy because he felt like they were profiting uh, making you know their profits kept going up and up and up but his salary really wasn't going up that was commensurate to what they were doing in terms of ad revenue and so he was not that's the understanding i have and so the negotiations went in they really didn't meet what he thought was a reasonable uh, amount and so uh he was offered the opportunity with at westwood one to start his own yep a competing countdown, which would yeah. have been uh, Casey's Top 40, which debuted in January of 1989. Uh, he left AT40 in August of 88 yep. uh, with little fanfare. <laughs> and, yeah, and uh, and but he had a non-compete clause, so he could not do Casey's Top 40 for the remainder of 1988. So uh, at that point, they had to have somebody. You know, there was a, there was obviously a search for, going on for Casey's replacement, and this is where you come into the picture. So uh, how, how did you find out about this? How did you hear about it? And uh, You know, when, when I first heard about it, I sent this gigantic card. It must have been three feet by three feet out to the people at ABC Watermark Corpor- Incorporated. And and I, I said, M- the, the sound is coming. Uh, I really, I, I because, I mean, 10 to 10 was in, in syndication at that time. And, and so I thought, okay, this is it. At the age of 25, I have found that place. And it was like, I'm in the right moment at the right time. And so when when ABC Watermark Incorporated reached out to me and they sent me scripts, I thought, holy God, please, this is it. This is it. This is what I've worked for my entire life. Because at the age of 14 and 15, I was doing countdowns in my bedroom. I was doing year-end countdowns on Christmas and where, where everybody was with the family, but I was in my bedroom doing these countdowns. I took two and three days to do. And because that that's who I thought I was and I still am. And the thing is, is that when that letter came in, I thought, oh my God, this is going to be. And the Charlotte observer wrote this beautiful story about me but also the charlotte observer wrote a story about me where i said where i failed and and it's like oh and that's what i've held on to all of these years it wasn't the Mm. victory of getting recognized it was the victory of i failed i didn't get the job well what you did get was uh, a great story and i always say there's no life experience that is truly wasted if you get a, as long as you get a good story out of it <laughs> and you got a good, you, there is a good story here because, uh, you know, now, now how close did it come? I know that obviously shadow Stevens got the, uh, got the gig and did it until 1995 when Casey's, uh, top 40 eventually, uh, basically trumped, uh, the American top 40 countdown. And I, I I'm sure he was, uh, smiling to himself at some point, <laughs> <laughs> but that's another story, uh, for another time. But now how, cause I, I know, you know, I'm sure there was competition there, but I think from what I understand, it was, it came down uh, pretty, uh, pretty close between you and shadow. Stephen. Top what? five, top five. And, and let, okay. let's, let's be honest. Let's go ahead and look at Los Angeles radio. Okay. Is that if mm-hmm. you're going to make it in Los Angeles radio, get the radio station and then you can build from there because look at look at Ryan Seacrest he got the radio show and then got American Top 40 and the thing is who was this guy from Charlotte North Carolina why would he be here and, and I totally respect uh, Shadow Stevens because he had an ad agency and he had history in Los Angeles they needed somebody that had true roots in in, in being present and making sure that things went and and I, and I you know what I love Shadow but at the same time I'm going I'm Shadow Stevens and this is American Top 40. Shadow, shut the hell up. You sound like a disc jockey. Why can't you tell me a story <laughs> like Casey used to do? <laughs> or like you did at 10 at 10. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. That, but that was 100% Bill Conway. Bill Conway sat down with me and said, share the story. Share the story. Yeah. Make it feel like you were there. Yeah. Although you have all of these sound bites and you... Listen, listen, Adam. Uh, when it came to 10 at 10, there were no books. There was no inter- there was no internet. There was nothing. I had to physically go out there and make sure that I had the information that was very, very, very real. And I mean, because I had to do the research. It was hardcore. Dig in, get it right, and move forward. And that's when I learned about the Vietnam War and, and, and the Gulf of Tonkin and stuff. I would have 
never known that if I did not know that, that what was going on in, in history through the, the through the elements of of all these encyclopedias and all of these books. I had to do the research. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you got something out of it, even though at the time you, you had a, a reason and a purpose for doing it. You know, it's, it's something that served you well in the interim as well. And so, you know, again, not a wasted experience. So, so now how many uh, interviews, meetings did you actually have with, with the people at ABC Watermark? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm assuming it was multiple meetings. A lot of letters, a lot of letters. And then when it came to deciding time, I, I you know, it's one of those where the, the, you know, they always say that when you're an actor or, or you're in the entertainment business, there's going to be a long period of time. It could be six months. It could be a year before you hear from them again. And it was a very long time. And so when I got the letter, sure, I, I really was very hurt. And, and let me tell you something, what, what, what happened here. And this is being transparent. When I got the letter, 104.7 did everything they could to comfort me. And Bill Conway said, I'm going to give you a countdown on this radio station so that you can still do what you love most. And I looked at him and I was being a real butt. I let my ego get away from me. And what he did was because I was being such a jerk, he put me on overnight radio. I remember going to Uptown Charlotte on the corner of Trade and Tryon and literally falling to my knees on that corner and crying so hard because I, at that moment, moment in time, I felt like I was a failure because I couldn't live up to my dreams. My dreams failed me and I, and I didn't want a radio station to feel like they had to baby me. It was such a hard moment in my life. Yeah, I'm sure that must have been just really crushing. I can't imagine because you know you came so close, and you know to get that close to the, to the to the prize, as it were. I mean, that's uh, you know that does it, it really is tough when you know the the result is not what you had wanted right, right. or hoped for. And so, yeah. Now, did you actually fly out there and do an interview with them? Like, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in addition to the letters, did you? I wish, because I think if they would have saw my passion, they would realize that that there was something there more than Shadow Stevens. I'm not, I'm not knocking at Shadow Stevens, but I think if people see the passion that I have about sharing the story and being with the artist and sharing their journey and really bringing things forward, that to me is, is what opens up the door. And I think that's the reason why... Even today, I get these the, the the biggest names in music as well as the newcomers because my passion is to share the story, or someone is going to write it for them, and I don't want that to happen. And so, so therefore, I think that negative moment in my life became the fuel of my present day. Yeah, well, and that's a that's a good fuel to have, you know. And like I said, it's uh, you know there, there's a story there, and and it's and it is a a um. You know, and and when thing when things don't turn out the way that uh, that we had hoped for, uh, they sometimes uh, there's another prize waiting in, in another way. Uh, there there are other gifts that we have and that come to us as a result of not getting what we think we want. So there's that too, uh, and we can talk about you know just uh, real quickly about uh, what's happened uh, in your life, the life path you've taken since uh, the days of uh, '80s radio and. Uh, all of that because that's an interesting uh, story too well it's the fear of being fired that's what controlled 26 years of my radio career the fear of being fired basically meaning that you want me to jump how high okay i'm there because i don't want to be fired and then when i was finally fired it was like whoa whoa what 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 happened here i i it you know it's like it's like what i i i wish i would have been fired earlier because now i have a new thing that i can build a platform on and and that's the thing about it is that the, the you know once things started to separate in the corporate world of radio all of a sudden i realized wait i'm doing their job i'm playing their part i'm doing everything they want me to do but nobody is playing what I see, what I envision, what I dream. And so when, when I left Terrestrial Radio in 2015, that to me was the greatest moment of my life because all of a sudden I was in control. Even though I used the same tools that I was taught all of those years before me, 36 years of radio, the thing is, is that I I'm in control. I get to make the decision. I get to decide that, oh, well, that's not something that I want my listeners to do. I'm going to change this out. But it's, but the thing is, is that it's not in other people's hands where a consultant would say, yeah, he's not fit in the role. 
Well, what do you mean I'm not fitting the role? I, I am the role because I know who my listener is. But let me tell you something, Adam. I'm going to tell you something. I'm, I'm, I'm wrong in that because until September of 2020, I thought I knew who my listeners were until I landed that job at Harris Teeter. And when I was right there with those people in that grocery store in 2020, I Everything changed in that moment. And I would love to go back to day one of radio with the knowledge that I have of who real people are in this in this day, because I didn't know. I was all about research. This is what the research shows that your listener is doing. This is who she is. This is how many kids she has. This is a car she's driving. But at a grocery store, it's wrong. It's absolutely 100 percent wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um... And, and it is interesting how you you wound up there, but and and it's great because, like you said, you you actually get to hear people's real stories in the yes. real world, uh, and that is that is a blessing too. That's that's a real gift. Um, and and for a bit there, you worked. Uh, it was at iHeart, right? And oh, you were yeah. Doing Many years. Some, yeah. And and your position there exactly was. I I knew, I knew you were working there, but I wasn't exactly sure what the official position was production director i was in charge okay. of production because i believe that commercials on the radio do not care about the listener and and they they will spend thousands of dollars these advertisers for people in radio to give them the opportunity to put their sound out there but they don't care about the listener my goal was to de- was to develop a relationship between the listener and the client I was the freak. I was the weird one. Nobody understood what it was that I was trying to do. And because I believe that if you're going to come into our station and spend $3,000 or $40,000, I want to put you in front of that listener in the way of being somebody who can help change their lives. Hey, hey, Arrow, can you just stop being an artist? And we we need flow. It's called cash flow. Uh, The the, the client doesn't understand what you're saying. Uh, just, Just please shut up and do your job. Yeah, that can be a bit tiring to say the least. Huh. And uh, yeah, I can I can imagine. Yeah, I uh, that that gets old, as they say. <laughs> yeah, and so you and I, I we I didn't get to this part, but I will real quick. Uh, it's that uh, you had done some. Uh, I I am a part time film critic, and I uh, there are a lot of press screenings that I get invited to, and you uh, worked for Allied, which is uh, one of the companies that uh, holds these press screenings, and so you were. Uh, organizing or uh, overseeing some of those, I guess you would say. Uh, and that's how you and I connected uh, on a personal level. And so that's another uh, feather in your cap, as it were. Well, it, I, first of all, I didn't like movies at all until until I met my, my wife, my wife of 32 years. And, and so for, for this opportunity to be with, with people, allied, and everybody else involved, this is part of the full vision. We, it, you know, it, it's about people connection. And, and that's what I love about it is that, is that people are coming to see a movie. The critics are there. And, and everything that unfolds and takes place is such a beautiful moment. And, and more people don't understand that. But of course, I can't talk about it on, on any podcast or radio show because that's a conflict of interest. But the thing is, though, is that as a regular, everyday person, just to be there to help serve people is so important to my life and lifestyle. And that's a uh, that's a good message. Everybody should uh, everybody should follow that uh, life philosophy. I think I I, uh, I think we'd all do better if we did. <laughs> well, uh, it looks like uh, the, uh, the the time is just about up on this uh, this this uh, edition of Adam's Corner. But I just wanted to thank you for coming on and telling us your story because it is an interesting story. What did you and learn? Wanted- what did you learn, Adam? Because that, that's the teacher in me coming out now because I've been a broadcast instructor since 1988. What did you learn? <laughs> well, I learned uh, that uh, uh, you came from, you hailed from Montana and made your way around uh, to various markets and uh, through uh, fortuitous circumstances, found your way in Charlotte. And I, I found out about the, um, uh, the the beginnings and of ten at ten how that all came to be and um, and and your at forty story is interesting too how close you came so those were some things that I got from this yeah. uh, this interview and and where your the journey your life has taken you now where you're actually uh, you know out there interacting with people and getting their stories yeah so uh those are things that i took away from it and it's, I'll tell uh, you it's what, a good story if you ever want to hear old ten at ten episodes i've got them. 
I've got them. I saved everything. Would love to. And Would love to. Oh my god! And I, I, I put them up on uh, Spreaker, which is attached to uh, iHeartRadio. Dude, uh-huh. they blasted the crap out of me. They took it down so fast because it's music. They didn't see the art of what it was all about. But because it's copywritten music, I understand. I God bless them. But but it's it's a side of radio that is being long gone and forgotten. And and, and I wish they would just let that go and let the performance happen yeah i uh i wish so too because i'd love to hear some of those again uh uh, yeah well well my friend i'm gonna let you go because it looks like we're getting ready to get cut off here so i'm gonna end it right there uh but uh let's uh maybe we can pick this up in the future and talk about some of the changes in radio since the 80s and uh what what your thoughts are on those that would be an interesting topic i believe oh my god such a blessed moment tonight thank you so much (laughs) 